The men who owned the wire service were obviously powerful people, and because it was so lucrative, those who had it coveted it. When we were still in Houston, all the service for the uh, sports events, the horse race and everything, came into, my, came into our garage. My father had the service, and several uh, people tried to get the service. In fact, they burned our garage down. By the 1920s, this was consolidated into what was called the Continental Wire Service. And in 1927, this was taken over by Moses Annenberg, a multimillionaire publisher, owner of the Philadelphia Inquirer newspaper, a very prestigious newspaper. Annenberg believed he was simply providing a news service with the horse race wire. Still, while the wire made him wealthy, it tainted his image to be associated with the underworld who ran the clubs that bought the wire service. His son Walter has spent his life developing a more wholesome and philanthropic family reputation, at one point donating half a billion dollars to public education. He also served as U.S. Ambassador to Great Britain and, among other honors, received the Medal of Freedom from President Reagan. Jackie Gawne went on to great success in Las Vegas, owning many hotel casinos, including... Union Plaza, Las Vegas Club, El Cortez, Western, Goldspike. And the Resnick boys also did quite well in the horse book business in Detroit. No thanks to Emil's son, Bernie. I'm four years old and they asked me to pick a horse. And I ran my finger down and I got one, I pointed to one called Pomegranate. And everybody in the joint bet on it. And it won. It cost my father. $2,500. Now, in those days, $2,500 was an awful lot of money. By the time the smoke cleared and the screaming stopped, stopped I was barred from the, from the horse book for the, rest, for the rest of my childhood. During the Roaring Twenties, Hollywood's elite had been heading down to what was called the wickedest city in the world, a place just south of Tijuana, Mexico, called Agua Caliente, which offered luxury, privacy, casinos, and a racetrack. When Caliente shut down in 1935, the in crowd went out to the desert, east of Los Angeles, near what is now Palm Springs. The first club that opened was called the Dunes and was owned by a man named Al Wertheimer. You never heard of the mafia in those days. It was just hoods in Chicago and Detroit. And he was supposedly one of the hoods from a gang they called the Purple Gang. It was a coat and tie joint that catered to such well-known names as Errol Flynn, Howard Hughes, John Ireland and Dorothy Parker. Then Earl Saucer opened the 139 Club, named like many clubs for its lot number. It was a very cheaply built little house, and uh, the walls, he had plywood all around the walls, and he'd get movie stars to sign them. And then they would burn it in with a burning pencil the next day, a poem, something cute, like Dorothy Parker. She wrote Little Dottie, the gambling kid. Wanted to win and always did. I ate your free food and drank your booze. At a game like that, how could I lose, Dee Parker? The famous duo of Clark Gable and Carol Lombard had signed the walls, as had frequent guests Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz. In fact, um, Lucy had to cut him off. She limited him to $5,000 loss, and then he, they wouldn't let him play anymore, because he was, he was a wild man on the gambling table. The Cove actually had valet car parkers, and like other Palm Springs clubs, locals were not allowed inside to gamble. The gambling houses in the desert were like private clubs for the rich and famous. Well, we might get a phone call from, from uh, let's say, uh, one of the wealthy horse owners. As you know, the boys, this might be one of the Whitney's or one of them, something like that, are, uh, we have horses running at Santa Anita tomorrow. And the boys want to go and see the morning workouts. So we're having dinner at the club early, which would have been the Palm Springs Racket Club. And then we'd like to know if we could reserve a roulette table at 8.30 for a couple of hours. And they would not only request a table to be reserved, they would request the dealer if he's still in your employ. Another favorite trendy hangout was, oddly enough, three miles off the coast of L.A. on several huge gambling ships. Tony Conero, one of many names, uh, operated uh, some large World War I vessels he purchased and converted into floating casinos. 